Test, test. Fail, fail. Dr. Drew, could you please come up to the front of the room? The policy board is going to start in one minute, so if all uh, policy board members could please take your seats. All policy board members, please take your seats. We're working on a few technical difficulties. So hold tight. Don't move. All right, Jenny? We're gonna we're back engaged. Sort of. We are not online. We're not online, but we're gonna go we're gonna hold off on the cancer crab discussion and see if we can't get online, but let Jenny go through the stock assessment stuff real quick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to start off by pointing out some changes, proposed changes uh, that the ASC and MSC um, have suggested to the policy board to the stock assessment schedule. Um, the first being American Lobster. I'd like to highlight that we are going to be delaying the assessment. Uh, there were some uh, problems identified with the landings data that needed to be corrected, and that pushed us off by about three to four months. So we anticipate completion of the stock assessment sometime around the end of the year, and we hope to have a peer review for you uh, peer review document next uh, spring meeting. Uh, in, the, in the meantime, the Lobster Board members should know that we are going to be providing a model-free indicator update to you all uh, in August at the August Board meeting, so that should hopefully um, provide uh, an interim picture of what the stock's doing before we have the final model outputs. Keep moving along with the schedule, okay. Some of the other highlights are that the uh, black sea bass assessment discussion uh, occurred at the NRCC meeting recently, and the NRCC agreed to move forward with a new plan for a benchmark stock assessment. The data preparation work would begin this fall, and the idea would be that we would have a new uh, assessment that would be peer reviewed sometime in 2016 at the latest, and that, that the results of this of that assessment, if it passed peer review, would then be available for, to, for use with spec setting in 2017. For the 2017 spec setting, I should say, be explicit. Um, the one thing that you'll notice on the schedule is that we have ASMFC highlighted as the review venue for that assessment. Um, that is not set in stone, but it's an option that the NRCC, the Council, and the Commission may um, hold in the back pocket to, just in case the assessment um, is done earlier or faster or, or slower. We can get it in and get it done in time for the 2017 spec setting is the idea. Uh, moving along, horseshoe crab. Uh, the ASC and the horseshoe crab technical committee recommended that uh, the benchmark stock assessment for this species be put on hold until uh, procedures regarding the use of confidential biomedical data be put in place. As you all are well aware, uh, any analyses done that would include fishery dependent data could not be shared with a peer review panel, the board, or members of the public, and therefore the TC is and the ASC are concerned that any work done on that would um, essentially be wasted. Um, they could, in the meantime, however, update all the fishery independent indices, and they can do that on the regular, regularly scheduled um, stock assessment uh, plan. Uh, the multi-species VPA is also changed up a little bit here. The ASC considered uh, the timing of this and suggested that we wait until the Menhaden benchmark assessment is peer-reviewed in December. The MSVPA and several other models and plans for ecological reference point uh, development will be at least their preliminary results and plan will be reviewed at that peer review uh, in, in December. Uh, and the idea being that we don't know how that's all going to, to fall out. Uh, we may need something sooner. We may need some more time for model development. There may be new models that we'll want to consider uh, either in supplement to the MSVP or in, uh, in place of it. And so we'd like to, the AC would like to reconsider when ecological reference points in the MSVP would be peer reviewed after hearing the preliminary peer review results in December. Uh, Northern Shrimp. Northern Shrimp did not pass the most recent peer review, so the Stock Assessment Subcommittee recommends a new benchmark be uh, done uh, on a faster time scale than originally planned. They'd like to do it within the next three years, which would place it in 2017. And this would allow uh, time for more uh, model development, but also get it done um, so that it can be used more quickly than originally planned. 
Uh, SPOT was also reviewed by the ASC and they recommend that a new benchmark assessment be conducted for this species but that it be done in tandem with Atlantic croaker. The idea he being here that the same people, the same data sets, the same type of models would all be considered and we could more efficiently go through this process if we do both species at once. And so uh, croaker is on the schedule for 2016 and we suggested that SPOT be placed on the schedule at the same time as croaker. Any, question, any questions about changes, suggested changes to the stock assessment schedule? Pat? Working from over there. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Jenny. A quick question. We've, we've, we've been coming up with the same issue and problem with horseshoe crabs uh, for several years now without being able to get the data we need to determine what the status of the stock is. And unless we can change the way we operate to get that data, um, it just seems to me, and I would love to take a draconian move, and when we get back to it again, I would love to cut their quotas drastically. So they will support us by giving up the information we need. Whether it's collective or not, we cannot make an assessment. We've taken all these draconian measures because of red knots and shorebirds and everything else. Commercial have cut back, recreational have cut back. We are in d dire straits in New York. Our, our stock is on a sharp decline. I think Jim could verify that. It hasn't gone up since the other states have cut back on their quota. In the meantime, because we have one sector that is extremely valuable to the world, it's valuable to me, it saved my life, uh, the reality still remains that we have not been able to get the data we need to make a correct assessment. And I'm not sure what other draconian measures we can take other than cutting off their supply. I'm willing to hear someone else's idea, but to go away from this meeting without taking some action, either writing letters to them, sending them a form, that they will confidentially submit it to us, that the data they supply will be all put together, as opposed to separating it out so they're identified as to what they're processing. Um, I just think we have to do that. Otherwise, we're going to be at this meeting another year from now. Their, their, their harvest rate continues to go up exponentially. And yet we have no control over what they take. And again, on the other hand, we're caught. It's a catch-22 because the product is such an essential uh, thing for the world. So whatever we can do, Mr. Chairman or Ms. Chairman, I wish we would take some action on that. Thank you. Tony? Pat, it's not that the biomedical companies aren't willing to supply us with their data. They are willing to supply it to us, but then we cannot report it back to the Horseshoe Crab Board because of the way we want to split it out into the regional assessments without um, disclosing the confidentiality. You would be able to come back and detail how much is coming from a single biomedical company with how we would present the results to the Horseshoe Crab Board. So it's not that they're unwilling to provide it to us, it's that we then presenting it back to you would be disclosing the confidentiality. Just to follow on. Jim, hold on a minute. Jenny, did you want to follow up on that and then you can go ahead. Yeah, just one thing to add to what Tony has said. Um, the t t Horseshoe Crab TC is concerned about conducting the coastwide assessment now as well because of the, uh, they would like to add the biomedical mortality to that. And again, as, as Tony indicated, it, any uh, analyses that we would conduct, the results we couldn't show because you could simply subtract. You could look back at the old assessments and subtract the numbers and figure out how much they're, they're well, you theoretically could. Okay, Pat. Uh, so uh, if we could do it on a coastwide basis, would you have to marry their numbers back to the region? Now think about it. You just said if we did it on a coastwide basis, do we have to, ma do we have to marry their data back to the region that the horseshoe crabs come from? And that, it appears to me, would be better than what we have right now. Right now we really can't rely on what we have. So we've got to move forward somehow. So what is the dilemma? How do we get out of this dilemma? I would have to get back to you, Pat, because I was not a part of the discussions of the coast-wide um, assessment, because uh, there are more than three companies, so I would think on a coast-wide assessment it 
would be okay to add the biomedical information, but there may be something going on there that I'm unaware of, and so I would have to report back to the policy board on that. Could you report back to us collectively, please? That would be most helpful to see where we think may go for the next step, because we're we're in a dilemma right now. We're in a canal, and we're not out of it. We have no further information. We sit here wallowing because we can't come up with a good assessment, and, and I think it's absolutely essential to move forward with this. All the states have committed to doing what was right, to reduce their quota harvest and everything else. So now I think we've got to get the other piece of the information, bring it to the table so we can complete our assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Uh, Richie White, and then I have Dennis Abbott. Any? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, could we ask the individual uh, industry uh, if they would be willing to waiver all uh, uh, Issues. I mean, release the the amount they're harvesting individually. If they would sign something that would allow us to do that, we have um, had those discussions with them, and they have not been in favor of doing that because then it puts them potentially at a disadvantage with their competitor companies of how much of the. Then I'm going to say it wrong. Lias, the product that they make from the blood, how much capacity or ability they have to make that product and so therefore they don't want to have that information disclosed to their competitors. Dennis? Thank you. Jenny, I re recall reading an article recently in the local papers of a study done by the University of New Hampshire regarding horseshoe crab mortality in the biomedical industry saying that the mortality is much greater than previously thought. Have you seen that article or aware of it? I have not. I'm sorry. Uh, I can look at it. I can look into that if you'd like and we can... I'll, I'll also see if I can find it someplace. Right. Are you referring to the article done by the University of New Hampshire, yes. that study? The technical committee actually reviewed that article. Um, and so what the research indicated that after bleeding, um, female horseshoe crabs have a lower spawning rate. And so the TC reviewed that article and found that um, the conditions that they used to do the research didn't follow the best um, management practices. So the TC thought that uh, they acknowledged that the study does show that, but because they didn't follow the BMPs, they were hesitant to really endorse that study. Any other questions? Yeah, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm not sure if this is for Jenny or Tony, but uh, Jenny or Tony, but the delay in the black sea bass um, assessment for new model development, does that relate to the issues that we were concerned about and conveyed in our letter? Uh, the scientific uncertainties, are, are, have they come to terms with those issues? And is that, does that relate to the delay? Thank you. It, it does relate to the delay in the amount of time that we think it is going to take to get a viable model up for peer review that could inform specifications. And so we tried to set us up with a time frame where we believe we can produce something to inform specs for 2017. And if we can get it out there sooner, then we most certainly will um, aim to do so. Quick follow-up, so is the bad news perhaps that there's a delay, but the good news that the new model might perhaps finally get us out of the Tier 4 status? That is our hope. Further questions? Okay, as I understand it, we have to approve the, uh, um, the stock assessment schedule here. Uh, go ahead, Pat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Excellent report. I move that the board approve the stock assessment um, as presented. Is there a second? Bill Adler, any discussions on this? Any opposition to approving the uh, 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 stock assessment schedule? Seeing none, thank you, Jenny. You're back up. Yes, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now Vice Chairman again. <laughs> are, we, are we live and local? We're live and local. So okay. You want to do crab? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
I am going to report out for the fishery improvement project. Um, Jen Levin couldn't be here from GMRI, so I said that I would give her presentation. Um, as you know, the board has been discussing uh, cancer crab fishery and whether or not we would like to move forward with initiating a cancer crab FMP based on the work that the fishery improvement project has been doing. For those of you that are unfamiliar with a fishery improvement project, it is is a group of stakeholders typically including retailers, processors, producers, and fishermen that come together to try to solve a problem within a specific fishery or to improve a certain aspect of that fishery that requires attention. And that the focus of their work plans are the um, environmental integrity and the long-term sustainability of those fisheries. Um, the Jonah Crab um, Fishery Improvement Project Working Group includes several members listed up on the screen. They came from all different types of backgrounds. Um, the work group has been going on since 2012 to better understand the Jonah Crab fishery, the threats to its sustainability, and the actions that can be taken to have long-term sustainability of the resource. Um, the efforts that they have done to date, um, they have worked off of the Marine Stewardship Council's pre-assessment um, and uh, their, their criteria that they use. Uh, the work plan outlines activities and a timeline for completion and recommendations um, that were put together for the commission. And I should note that in your briefing materials you had two documents. One is the recommendations to the commission and then the second was is an extensive overview of the Jonah Crab fishery. Um, Jonah crab has long been considered a bycatch in the lobster fishery while there are still some individual fishermen that direct on Jonah crab. In recent years the um, has been increased targeting pressure on the crabs and likely uh, due to a fast growing market and demand could compromise the long term health of the fishery. The um, Jonah crab resource is unregulated in federal waters and for the most part in most state waters but most of the landing do come from um, federal waters in Area 3. Uh, landings and effort have been increasing rapidly um, and in an unregulated ma matter. Since 2002, landings have increased sixfold. Um, and in 2013, we we're just close to 11 um, million pounds. The landings in 2013 came from Massachusetts at 7.5 million, Rhode Island at 3.2 million, Maine at just about a half a million, New Jersey at 68,000, Maryland at 22,000 in New York just over a thousand pounds. Uh, in the past there have been landings as far south as Virginia. There are no minimum size regulations for Jonah crab. There are some size limits that are based on blue crab and lobster in the states of New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, and Maryland. And there are no regulations to um, protect the spawning stock biomass um, or regulations on prohibiting female harvest. There are a couple of states that do have harvest limits including New York, Maine, and Maryland. The fisheries value has increased substantially in the past several years with this increase in landings. Um, in 2000 it was about 1.5 million and in 2012 it was worth about 8.1 million pounds in ex vessel value. Um, there is a concern from the fishery improvement project that with the loss of if there is um, no regulations in put in place and the fishery um, starts, the fish start to decline, that there could be a loss of the market and then the ex vessel price would likely drop if we don't put any regulations in place. Um, there's also a concern with an expanded crab fishery. It could threaten the management program that we've put together for the lobster plan to reduce traps um, in um, both 
southern New England waters as well as um, George's Bank and uh, Gulf of Maine. It also um, has concerns about with increased number of traps in the water, we would have more interactions with right whales. Um, the Conservation Alliance for Seafood Solutions is a collaborative of 18 organizations that um, advise companies on seafood sustainability and develop guidelines for the fishery improvement projects in order to encourage buyers to support fisheries that are working to address environmental issues, even when the fishery doesn't necessarily meet a sustainability criteria. And there are several supermarkets and other major buyers that may stop purchasing um, a Jonah crab product unless uh, it can prove that it is managed sustainably. And so therefore, there is concern amongst some of the industry members that if the, no regulations get put in place, that they will stop being purchased and then the fishermen will lose their market. Um, so. Uh, this market then would be compromised in the long-term sustainability of the fishery. So the FIP um, recommended to incorporate a Jonah Crab um, FMP into the Lobster Management Board. Um, it would tie the harvest of Jonah Crab to a lobster license and um, trap tagging requirements as it's currently done in Mass, New Hampshire, and Maine. And for states that do not have a lobster license to require a license and trap tags for the harvest of Jonah Crab. It also recommends requiring a five-inch minimum carapace um, with uh, an enforcement for a certain amount of tolerance due to the nature of the prosecution of the fishery, as well as require full reporting of cancer crabs by species to better understand the fishery and establish uh, baseline data. And lastly, they recommend to prohibit the harvest of female Jonah crabs. And they recommended this as an emergency action that the commission could take prior to adopting an FMP if we did go forward with an initiating one because they feel as though this is an important um, aspect to the plan because they are concerned about the stock. Um, so if there's any questions, I do want to note that both David Borden and Steve Train served on this fishery improvement project, if you didn't notice from the list, so they also could add additional um, information to the board. Thank you, Tony. Take some questions for Tony. Richie, we'll start over here on the right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Tony, do we have any sense of, of the breakdown of harvest? It seems like the overwhelming majority is federal waters, but do we have any sense of what percentage uh, federal to state? Um, and then I have a follow-up comment, Mr. Chairman. I don't believe that we have that listed, but David, do you have a more specific yeah. answer? I mean, to Richie's point, uh, that information is not part of the information that came forward. We don't have an exact breakdown, but I, I think it's pretty safe to say that the majority of the harvest is, is coming from federal waters, particularly in southern New England, where most of the fishery is located anywhere from 20 to 50 miles off the coast, 60 miles off the coast. <clears throat> Follow up, Mr. Chair. Th th thank you. Um, I, I guess I, you know, why, why, why is it uh, put to the commission to manage a resource that's the overwhelming majority is in federal waters? Um, you know, why isn't this something uh, the service is starting this process? And, and I mean, I understand the landings come to us, but. Um, you know, there's a lot of species where all the landings come to us and we have nothing to do with them, you know, like bluefin tuna. And so. That's a good question. I mean, remember when we requested a, I think there was a joint plan or a stock assessment or something for weak fish and there just wasn't the time at the service level. I don't know if the service wants to address that question or not. But it would seem like if it's if it's coupled with the lobster fishery, that may make the sense, make sense, because um, then you'd have the feds involved in your lobster fishery. And I don't know that that's particularly. But anyway, I got um, Bill Adler. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, we do have a catch of uh, uh, crab in state waters as well. Um, it's nothing like the offshore fleet, but we, we do have that. Uh, so we do also, I don't remember, Tony, I thought Tony said there weren't any rules in Massachusetts. Um, we do have a closed season um, January to a certain month uh, for the taking of, uh, of edible crabs. We do have that in the state statutes. I think it's in one of these pages on these charts anyway. We do have that. Um, it, it, and uh, what was the, I forgot the rest of the thing. Okay, never mind. Adam? The document in the briefing materials indicates some of the confusion that occurs between the Jonah crab and the rock crab. What you suggested in the presentation here was full reporting of all cancer species, which would include the rock crab at that point. The rock crab is predominantly a species in state waters and is not typically found as far offshore or is not harvested in the numbers that the Jonah crab is in. So what would you propose as that full reporting? What would it fall under and how would it affect that rock crab that is a fairly significant bait crab in some of our fisheries? Adam, the FIP one of the reasons why the Commission had recommended a full cancer crab as well as the FIP, FMP is because of the confusion in the data and the uncertainty in some of the landings if you were trying to parse them out. And so that's why we want full reporting and an understanding of the difference between the two species. The um, problem comes where the common name for um, uh, Jonah crab is rock crab, and the common name for rock crab is sand crab. So that's why the data has some uncertainty to it. Um, and so for right now, what the FIP had recommended was we um, have full reporting for everything so that we can have a better clarity on that data, but the um, the measures uh, focus on Jonah crab at first until we have a better understanding of what the state landings look like for the um, rock crab. Is that, I would turn to Steve and David to make sure that I have accurately um, stated what the FIP said. Well, I got Steve and then I got Dave, so we'll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to clear up some of the questions as to why it's here. Um, we have other we have other species that we manage, co-manage with the feds, and, and uh, we have shrimp that's primarily harvested in federal waters. The participants in the fishery, and we had a lot of them at that meetings at the meetings we've had, actually requested because they are primarily lobster fishermen, and this is a, a secondary harvest or a secondary species to have the same management to keep everything simple. They actually were hoping we could tie it together, much like the states of Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts already do with their lobster license. Dave Board. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just follow up on, on Steve's point, and this gets to the question that Richie uh, related to us, is 99% of the crabs currently are landed by individuals with lobster licenses. So when this issue came up for the FIP process, it made no sense to start out with a completely separate uh, uh, FMP, and, and uh, the point was that since that larger percent were harvested by the the uh, individuals with either state or federal lobster licenses, we thought it would be appropriate to direct these recommendations to the commission since the commission is the lead agency on lobsters. It's just logical. That, and that, I'm just trying to answer Richie's, Richie's point on that. Uh, 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 if I might, just for a couple of minutes, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a couple of other points that uh, so that you don't get into a lot of additional questions, maybe I can answer some of these for everyone's edification, is that this is an open, very much an open process. Uh, uh, we, and it, it was a very unusual process where, we, where the supermarkets basically paid uh, in conjunction with the processing industry to uh, develop the guidelines for a sustainability plan. 
uh, and you know, it, at least my history with fishery management issues, I'd never been part of a process where the supermarkets were were coming in and basically working with an institution like the Gulf of Maine Gulf of Maine Research Institute, and basically saying we want to ensure that this is a sustainable product going ahead. The other point I, I would make is that. Historically, Jonah crabs were a bycatch. Uh, now it's becoming a very much a targeted fishery, particularly in Massachusetts and, and uh, in Rhode Island. Uh, there are some landings uh, in Massachusetts uh, these days where individual vessels land 50,000 pounds of Jonah crabs worth 75 cents a pound. So it's a, the value of the, of the landings at certain times of year far exceeds the landings of the lobster in, uh, from the lobster resource which, were the, which was the uh, targeted fishery. And if you look just, uh, if you haven't had a chance to go through the documentation which I think is very extensive, it pulls together all of the known information on, on crabs, but if you just look at the uh, executive summary in the in the documents, it summarizes the problems that we're trying to avoid. In other words, we're trying to be proactive and deal with these problems up up front. And I think it's kind of critical, in my own view, to get ahead of these issues and not uh, allow a separate. Uh, crab fishery to develop in, in federal waters that ends up triggering all kinds of protected species issues, which it surely will. Uh, so I think this is a this is a good opportunity where um, the FIP process has developed a lot of the information that the commission would need to start the process. And I think the the important point here is that this is just the start of the process. If the if the policy board were to agree and forward this recommendation to the lobster board, it would start the process. It wouldn't, wouldn't, there wouldn't be a predetermined outcome. Uh, the board could, could look at the recommendations that the FIP formulated. And uh, I think what, what the staff, what Tony and Bob did was when they developed this year's budget, they actually budgeted fun funding to do that, uh, which I think was, you know, uh, in hindsight, an excellent uh, thing for the staff to do. But that would that would just start the process. They, the staff would take all this documentation, basically prepare a scoping document, and that would start the the process. So I I totally support this, and I hope the policy board endorses it endorses a recommendation. Steve Train has a motion for you, Mr. Chairman. Let me go to Dave Simpson first. Yeah, I uh, just wondered, um, you know, with the fall off of lobster um, and the idea that this would be, you know, best coupled, uh, you know, lobster, crab uh, managed fishery, whether, whether the traps, I, I know they catch a lot of Jonah's in lobster traps, but would they be designed differently if the focus became Jonah's, the dimensions of the trap, the the vents, uh, and the uh, well, especially the escape vent, but the funnels? How much would they start to look different, or you know, from a lobster trap? Yeah, can you answer that, and then you can move right on into whatever you got. Currently, without regulations on the crab fishery, they could do almost anything. But if it's, if it's concurrent regulation with the lobster fishery, which is what most of the guys are working under, uh, they've still got to have the legal lobster vent, and they've still got to maintain the trap limit as required by law. Without regulation in that fishery, a lot of what you said could happen. And my understanding is that in federal waters, if it's capable of catching a lobster, then it's a lobster trap. Is that essentially right? And so the vent size requirement would would apply and so forth. Perhaps you get a better answer down the end of the table, but we were told two different things. We were told that applies if you have a lobster license, but it doesn't if you don't. Are they as good with avocados? <laughs> Are they? Okay. Can you answer that? 
Hi, yeah, Peter Burns with the National Marine Fishery Service. Just to clarify, um, if someone has a federal lobster permit, they can only fish a lobster trap that meets the specifications of a, that are in the federal regulations. So they can't fish anything outside, just like Steve said. They can't um, fish outside the trap limit or fish a different design than a regular federal lobster trap. Thank you for that clarification. Steve, you've got something you want to present? I, didn't I have see a motion if you're ready for it. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to move to initiate a cancer crab fisheries management plan with the focus on Jonah crab and task the lobster board with development of the FMP. I got a motion from Mr. Train, second by Mr. Borden. Discussion on the motion? Richie? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, having heard the discussion with the, that clarified my question earlier, uh, I certainly support the motion, uh, but I also wonder if, uh, you know, in this time of financial uh, tightness and with uh, us not being able to do stock assessments as fast as we want them, um, would there be uh, the ability to ask the service to uh, provide some financial assistance in this effort where we really are managing a federal species and uh, to see if we could get some help financially to, to take this on? I think we can we can look into that and report back. Pat, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I'm, Dave Borden made a few comments that I'm not sure jive with what is on the board. If this is just to move the discussion to, back to the lobster board. The way this the way this reads is the lobster board is going to have to now initiate it and move forward with the development of an FMP. The way staff interprets this is that the we, that the policy board is saying we want to initiate an FMP, so we would start to put together a draft PID, but that. PID approval process just like we normally go through instead of the PID coming to the policy board it would go to the lobster board and in a sense what we um, had discussed is that it would likely become the lobster and cancer crab board um, coupled together they both would have their own individual FMPs but many aspects of those FMPs might um, be to the same it, in particular with the cancer crab FMP. Does that help? He's sleeping. I'll, I'm just going to follow up anyway. Um, it, it just, I, uh, <laughs> um, I, I'm going to support the motion. I think bringing some consistency into place is, is good at this time. I think uh, it helps us resolve um, some potential problems with the ES, ESA and Marine Mammal Protection Act issues that we, the states are continually dealing with, especially in, the, in New England with lobsters. Um, and just one little last bit of clarity. So this has been budgeted for then. That's from my understanding. We put tons in the budget to do some public hearings, yes. Tons in the budget? <laughs> tons. Dave Simpson? Yeah, so if I, you know, take Steve's comment and, and uh, Noah's comment um, that if, if we don't do this, then a crab fishery can develop independent of a lobster fishery. If they don't have a lobster permit, then sort of by definition they're not fishing a lobster trap, but they can go fish for Jonas, and that sounds like it would be really problematic, so I think this is a, a good idea to do. Um, I'll leave it at that. Doug? So, um, per Richie's comment about the who's going to help with the monitoring here, I. Um, 
I will be looking forward to uh, how you get back to us on Noah's response, and I, I might even uh, suggest um, either now or uh, at the August meeting that we write a letter saying we are planning on doing this. Um, what uh, financial assistance can you provide to help with monitoring and manage of this federally, this species is occurring in federal waters? Doug, we can do that, and um, I've had some pre-discussions with Mike Pentney um, at the Northeast, or at GARFO, and um, he has indicated that they um, would like to have a, a staff member serve on the um, plan development team as well, so they are already committing some resources um, to the development of the document, and in-kind resources, I guess you would say, um, and we can follow up with a request for additional um, resources. Kelly? Thanks, Chair. Uh, just in addition to what Tony said, I mean, I just would point out, obviously, the FY15 budget is already out for federal agencies um, in terms of what we've requested from Congress. Who knows what they'll actually provide, but this is certain some, certainly something that we can think about as part of moving forward with the planning for the FY16 budget if this is something that uh, we could potentially try and uh, discuss through the federal appropriations pro process, request process. Okay. Dave Borden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This will be very brief. I, I just want to give credit uh, and, and acknowledge the, the participation of the National Marine Fisheries Service. Uh, they had staff at every single one of these meetings, provided uh, information analysis, uh, did literature reviews. Um, Peter Burns and his staff have helped with some of the technical and uh, management issues. So. I, I totally understand why, why Doug and, and Richie are uh, pointing out the need for additional funding to support the effort, but the, I just point out that the National Marine Fisheries Service has been a very willing, uh, eager, and uh, successful participant in the process. It's good to hear. Any Bob? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll be brief. I strongly support the motion, and it's largely because of the strength and quality of the FIP process and the FIP report. I, I really think this has been an excellent process, and the results uh, are really compelling and really strong, and it provides a very strong basis to, uh, for us to move forward on. So credit to all those involved. Thank you. Dennis? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just as our federal partners just stated, just last week, we went over our budget for the next fiscal year also. And I don't think, I and mean, I know we didn't put money in for anything that would involve cancer crabs. That's not the budget. That was not the budget for next year. When I say for next year, the one that we're work will be working on. Oh. The commission has not done its action plan for 2015. We've only done our action plan for 2014. In um, the fall, we put forward the action plan, which we will put resources, how we allocate our resources to come back to the policy board and the full commission for their approval. So that would be something, if, if this motion passes, then we would put funds in to continue the development of an FMP. But we did reserve a, a small amount of money to do a few public hearings um, just in case the cancer crab FMP did go forward since we had been discussing it um, for the past several meetings. Anybody else? Seeing none, I'll read the motion. Move to initiate a cancer crab FMP with a focus on Jonah crab and task the American Lobster Board with the development of the FMP. Motion by Mr. Train, second by Mr. Borden. Is there any objection to the motion? Seeing none, it carries unanimously. Thank you.
Yeah, Shanna. Good afternoon. I'm going to go ahead and make this uh, nice and brief so we can uh, move along. Um, so back in October, um, the Committee on uh, Economics and Social Scientists uh, gave a presentation which listed a number of options as to where and what degree they could provide socioeconomic information. Um, the board suggested that SES actually complete a, safe, a case study on focal species that was a comprehensive socioeconomic analysis. Um, using our existing data, SES could provide useful information to the board regarding projected socioeconomic impacts of regulations or allocations. SES could also investigate the impacts on landings, trends, prices, fleet capacity, user conflicts and comp cooperation, as well as social variables. SES would also like to give socioeconomic impacts on not just what the current status of the fishery is, but also how past management actions have affected the fishery. Along with this, the CES would provide details of what data or information is currently not being collected for a stock that actually could have importance to future decisions. So during the board meeting, there were two species that were suggested to the CES, and those were lobster and eel. Um, recently, CES actually received a request from a Menhaden board member that CES also investigate various allocation options for Menhaden and both the social and economic impacts of those allocations. Essentially, what CES would like to hear from the board is which species they should begin with. Um, CES is more than willing to continue doing case studies in the future with other species, um, but we can only do one species at a time. Um, so any sort of recommendations uh, that you guys could put forth to us would be great. Uh, one of the considerations that we took into account were that we were going to start with eel, uh, but we realized that the addendum is already in progress and we would not be able to make any recommendations to that addendum in a quick time frame. And as a reminder to the policy board, the, reason, the rationale for why we can only do one species at a time is this, um, these, this avenue of case study cost approximately $20,000. So we have set aside that money in the budget to do one species for this year. Um, we do not have additional funds in order to do more than one at a time. So if we did uh, want to continue on with these types of studies, then we would need to set aside money for next year, et cetera. Tom McCall. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd like to put forth a recommendation that um, there's support to charge uh, C's with uh, beginning to explore a framework to consider allocation of Menhaden. Um, it is an issue that the, Man the Menhaden board discussed in December of 2000, I guess it was 12, when uh, we advanced the last amendment. Um, it is an action item in the 2014 plan that we begin to um, examine allocation issues so that when we have the 2016 assessment, we'd be able to also review the last allocation. So my interest is, is, is uh, if there's support to have C's work on, beginning to identify you know, a framework that the board could use to examine allocation from Menhaden, um, what some of the data needs might be, um, associated costs and timelines and um, see if we could uh, pull together the resources to have that information available um, f when we have the 2016 assessment. Thanks. So that's one vote for Min Hayden. Tom? I'll second that vote. After the last Min Hayden board meeting, we spent an hour and 15 minutes deciding if Florida could basically use a cast net fishery. We need to get this straightened out, so let's go and get it straightened out. Are there any other species that anyone would like to put forward for consideration? There was there was some discussion about. Um, I, I brought up a, a point. I can't remember when, um, but just about trying to do something that had broad-based interests, and one that I thought of was summer flounder um, and red drum. But red drum is sort of mostly southern state, the uh, southern summer flounder tends to affect more constituent groups and 
the others, but I think from some of the discussions that I've heard this week, um, the Menhaden seems to be a, a reasonable proposal to move forward with, especially with the issues that we're having with the bait fishery at this particular juncture. But certainly the floor is open for anyone that wants to suggest anything else. And But I saw John's hand up, so... Yeah, I was wondering if I could get a little bit more information on exactly the parameters would be for for this look on socioeconomic impact. Thank you. Staff? Yeah. I, we don't have anything specific currently. Uh, the issue is that we didn't really want to delve into a species without being positive that that's the direction that the board wanted to go. So what we can do is once we have established a species, we can definitely come back to the board with a game plan, a timeline, exactly what we think that we can pull and give to you. I just didn't want to set the committee off you know, on one thing and then kind of turn them over to something else. Pat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to uh, ask for some clarification in terms of the timing. Uh, Mr. O'Connell had asked for something uh, in parallel with the 2016 Menhaden assessment. I wanted to see if, if we wanted to wait that long or for the 2014 assessment. You got comments on that, Tom? Yeah, I just think that um, I, th I think the committee is going to require some time to begin to identify, you know, what sorts of criteria um, may be worthy of this board to consider um, in looking at allocation changes if there's a change. Um, have to come back to the board with some of those ideas and get further guidance from us. Look at what the time frames and costs would be. I just think that's going to take. Um, probably a, it's probably going to take the time that's probably going to parallel getting information out of the 2016 assessment. So I think we have to hear back from them, but I think it's going to take some time to pull together. So could we have that, asking staff, I mean, could we, could we have that uh, a, a summary of the approach and what you can give us by the, by the next meeting? Yeah, I think that should be possible. I already have a call scheduled for the end of May so that we can start to lay out some of those things. Is that the desire of the board? Is there any objection to that approach? Seeing none, that is so ordered. You want to go ahead and break and... We've been asked to go ahead and get through the action items. It should take about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll we'll regroup with the MREP discussion. So take it away. Jenny. All right, very quickly. Uh, the stock system prioritization agenda item. Um, the National Marine Fisheries Service has drafted a prioritization protocol for ranking stock assessments that would be conducted and reviewed each year. Uh, the idea behind this was that the all of the fish stocks would be uh, assigned scores or weighting uh, in a weighting scheme based on several factors including fishery importance, ecosystem importance, stock status, their biology, and the assessment history. And once all that that scoring was done then uh, there's a set of algorithms that they've developed that would then produce a draft schedule for each council um, and the idea the goal of this is to provide a, a somewhat more objective and transparent framework for for setting the stock assessment priorities each year uh, and uh, the spearheading this effort was Dr. Rick Mathot uh, he was kind enough to present to the Assessment Science Committee and science staff uh, on this process, the draft process, uh, and 
for answer some of our questions. They have solicited feedback from uh, the public and the Commission would like to provide some questions, comments and concerns. Uh, if you look in supplemental materials, there's a letter that's been drafted by staff summarizing the Assessment Science Committee and sa staff's concerns uh, with the the process. I won't go through all the details, but I will highlight a few of the, the issues that you're probably most concerned with. The first being that we, are, at least at this moment, are not considered in this process at all. And that was a, a, a red flag to us largely because some of our most high profile species like menhaden, lobster, and striped bass are all uh, involved stock assessment scientists from the NOAA Fisheries Centers and that several of our species are reviewed through the SARC and CDAR process. Uh, including red drum, menhaden, croaker. Um, also, because of that, if we aren't involved in that, that prioritization process, we're not sure how we would fit into the decision making at that point. Um, and so especially, uh, even for species that aren't managed or jointly managed with the, the councils, uh, we do have species that are completely under our own management process that do involve federal staff and federal uh, review venues. And so we were concerned that if we weren't involved in this, the prioritization setting, process setting, that we would um, we're not sure where we would fall out in all of that. And so we highlighted that concern. Also, number two, um, there's some some wording in the document that states that all state and commission managed stocks would automatically fall into a second tier for consideration. And we're concerned that our stocks would thus be placed at a lower or a low priority for assessments being conducted or reviewed. Um, and the other major concern, I think that uh, that those who've reviewed this process have is that the scoring system, while um, it's still trying to balance the needs of overfished or uh, stocks, overfished stocks or stocks that are in poor condition for one reason or another, um, with the needs of uh, our well-managed stocks or our stocks that are in good condition, the scoring system still appears to be heavily weighted towards stocks that are in poor condition. And we're concerned that many of our species, which may be in good condition because of frequent good stock assessments may be um, may end up suffering as a result so um, I, I don't know how much more detail you'd like me to go into at this point but I'm happy to answer any questions you may have Pat. Uh, thank you mr. chairman um, I read the comment in there about river herring um, have you had direct contact with them about doing something with that and are we going anywhere because it's as you know we're having a lot of uh, rivers passages being opened up and we're seeing a very good increase um, and those and those animals going upstream. So it just seems to me if that's just ignored or down down low in tier two, I think sooner or later we've got to get some attention to it. So could you help us on that one? Um, yes, we have spoken with Dr. Mathot and identified the fact that we're not currently updated in their databases that they're using to create this prioritization scheme. Uh, and he's, one of the problems that we ran into was that uh, what he's referring to is that River Herring has all the different systems assessments um, and that didn't really fit into the database that they're using. And so uh, we brought that to his attention and he's going to work with us to try and figure out a way to get into the system. Doug. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had the pleasure of uh, getting a report on this at our New England Council from uh, Dr. Mathot. And uh, uh, my first comment and comment by many of my fellow council members is, boy, this was put together by a stock assessment biologist, not a, <laughs> not a policy person. Uh, but that being said, I read over the letter, the draft letter, and I think uh, there are important concerns that I think the commission should move forward. Uh, in a letter to Dr. Mathot and uh, just to make him aware of these concerns that we have and uh, I'm hoping that we won't lose the, the uh, Regional Coordinating Council input into these two uh, because I think that's very valuable where we have Bob and I think Tony you sit on it too and trying to get uh, uh, some of our assessments done too. Thank you, Doug. I agree. Does anybody have a concern over the content of the letter or sending the letter to Dr. Mathot? Any objection to that? Seeing none, so ordered. One more item? Uh, two quick things. Two quick things. Kelly? Yeah, Kelly, number nine. Number nine. 
Are you surprised? Think, no. Okay. I'm just jotting down a little note there. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, so thank you, Chair. Um, just quickly, uh, we wanted to follow up on the 2014 Recreational Summit that was held here in D.C. Uh, back in April uh, that was focused on getting input from constituents um, on uh, a variety of recreational fishing-related uh, issues. Um, and one of the major outcomes uh, of that summit was uh, the agency deciding that it needed to develop a recreational fishing uh, management policy. And so uh, wanted to make sure that uh, this board was aware of that uh, decision and also kind of just quickly run through what that policy development process looks like. Uh, you uh, all as the states are key partners um, in this and we wanted to make sure uh, and flag this and also uh, towards the end I'll get to kind of my two requests uh, of the board, the commission. Um, so just quickly up here on the board you'll see um, running through kind of from this essentially now uh, until the end of the year uh, the idea is to start uh, initially with getting broad stakeholder input. Um, our approach is to have both uh, listening sessions in person as well as uh, sort of national webinar, use electronic technologies uh, kinds of approaches. Um, taking that input and developing a, a draft policy and then from there moving through some internal review and clearance, getting the document again back out for uh, an op an opportunity for folks to review and provide additional round of comments and then a, a final policy ideally uh, sometime in the winter. Uh, next slide please. Thank you. Um, so this is kind of hitting on uh, the key points in terms of uh, virtual which is we will be setting up a website we heard a number of comments uh, about wanting to get as broad a range as possible of stakeholders to be able to provide input into this policy and so one avenue to do that was to create uh, a website where folks would be able to go and provide uh, comments uh, on, in responses to some trigger questions that we'll be putting up there. Uh, we will, uh, as I mentioned, we'll also host uh, a national town hall um, and then also have uh, the MAFAC uh, recreational fishing subgroup uh, have uh, an opportunity to weigh in. And then uh, we will be hosting a state director's meeting in September. Uh, we see that as a critical uh, place where we'll be able to get input uh, as part of this. Uh, and then also uh, an interstate commission's webinar as another avenue. So here you have uh, a list of where we would be planning to hold our listening sessions. Uh, they are generally in conjunction with council meetings uh, as an opportunity to get stakeholders while they're participating in those other meetings. Uh, which brings me to uh, my, my two requests. Uh, the first would be uh, that we would be interested in being able to hold uh, a stakeholder input session as part of the August Commission meeting. Um, and so seeking feedback from uh, this board and the commission on that concept. Uh, and the second idea would be, um, again, trying to improve our outreach and uh, reaching as many anglers as we can, uh, would be uh, interest of board members in uh, providing information on the website access as part of public hearings or other outreach that you all are conducting uh, throughout the summer where we could provide that information to you all and ask that you share that with your stakeholders uh, as you're out and about uh, this summer. Uh, so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions and look forward to hearing the feedback. Any questions for Kelly? Any, any objection to participating with them in August? Uh, Dave? Kelly, do you, know, do you have dates for the September state director's meeting or is it still to be determined? Uh, we do. September 8th through 10th is what we're looking at. Tom? Over the years, I've attended many of these meetings, and this is probably one of the best run uh, with the commission staff. Laura doing a great job of getting the housing arrangements and everything else, and Daniel basically coordinating, and NIFS basically doing it. Just, it was one of the best runs meetings I've been at in a long time, and Russell Dunn did a great job in putting it together. 
So I just want to compliment them on Because, you know, sometimes you go to these things and you say, why am I wasting my time? And I don't think it was a waste of time. I was interested in listening to all the Hawaii fishermen, and they want to talk to me about a saltwater fishing license when I'm out there in December. So that should be an interesting meeting since they don't, they're one of the few states that, with like New Jersey and New York that don't have a saltwater fishing license. All right, and I guess folks could get with with you if they have constituent groups or meetings that they're going to hold over the summer to try to generate get that materials. You can certainly send me some. <laughs> I have a lot over the next three months. Anything else? One last thing. All right. Just uh, we were going to have a Habitat Committee and Law Enforcement Committee report, but I'm going to quickly just go through um, Habitat Committee as well as the Artificial Reef Committee met but, um, since our last meeting in February. Their um, committee reports are on the briefing CD. Please look at them. They've been doing some great work. Um, the Artificial Reef Committee is going to be developing guidelines for the marine artificial reef materials. It'll be the third edition as well as they're going to look into doing a white paper on the long-term economic benefits of artificial reefs. And then the Habitat Committee will be doing, um, for their habitat management series, nearshore and estuarine aquaculture, cyanide habitat source document, as well as a living shorelines guidance document, which will be an update from the first edition. And the um, Habitat Hotline will look at adaptations to climate change. Um, the Law Enforcement Committee met yesterday and today, and we will send out a report on their meeting to the policy board. All right. Any other business? Tom. Yeah, two interesting issues that have come up in the last month in New Jersey, but I think it's affecting along the whole coast. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, in the usual ultimate wisdom, is looking for places to get beach replenishment sand. So the third district, which is Philadelphia, says we're going to do you a favor, take the Matasquan Ridge and make it a burrow pit, and two of the lumps on one of our artificial reefs. So we're working on that. The other one is the seismic blasting. You know, uh, Kevin Walk and a, a bunch of the fishermen do the research on sturgeon, and they're proposing to do the sonic blasting in, in June and July when all the porpoises, turtles, sturgeon, and everything else is out, out there. And it's, you know, we, we shouldn't be doing it, plus it'll chase whatever fish for both the commercial and the recreational sector away from that whole area. I mean, if anybody is not realizing that the noise they generate with the sonic blast is. 250,000 decimals when an airplane is 120. I mean, so we have some resolutions going in from the New Jersey legislature on that if somebody pe people want to see copies of this. But the sand mining one concerns because, you know, we have problems enough with surf clams and things like that, and we don't want to destroy the, the places where they do it. And, you know, it's interesting. In the document, it says, these are important fishery areas, and by the way, we're going to take them and mine sand out of them. I mean, you know. And as far as the seismic blasting, they says, oh, and you would appreciate this, Lewis. They said that we could, they could have 600, and I think it was 620 takes. Now, isn't that nice? Would you like 620 marine mammal takes? I mean, this is what they're proposing just for the one operation. And as you're familiar, this is not just going to happen in New Jersey. They're going up and down the whole coast on this. So I thought I'd just bring that to your attention. And maybe the Habitat Committee could look at it. All righty. Anything else to come before the ISFMP Policy Board? If not, we will stand adjourned. And Bob? Yeah, we'll start the MRIP.